Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Karen Snape, and I'm the newest member of your forestry extension team. And today we're going to be talking about invasive plants. When we talk about invasive plants, we're talking about exotic invasive plants, those that are not native to our ecosystems here in Virginia, but were brought here by people. We're not talking about native plants that may be aggressive in the landscape. We're also not talking about non-native plants that aren't a problem. There are many wonderful species of plants from Europe and Asia and Africa that have been brought here and perform wonderfully without causing problems in our ecosystems. We're talking about those plants which are not native to our area and which cause a problem where they've been introduced. We're going to explore this topic further by looking at three specific examples. The first plant we're going to learn about is the garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is a herbaceous plant in the mustard family, and it's native to Europe and Asia. And it was brought here by European settlers who used it for culinary and medicinal purposes. And it's a biennial, which means that the plant lives for two years. In the first year, it's just a few leaves close to the ground. It actually is evergreen, it overwinters green in that stage. And then the next year it grows into a much taller plant that flowers and produces seed. When that plant dies at the end of the growing season, it's the seed that the next plant comes from. So let's take a closer look. So here's a good sized clump of garlic mustard. And as we zoom in on the leaves, you can see that they are serrated. They have these big teeth and they are heart or arrow shaped with long points and often a heart-shaped indentation at the base of the leaf. And they have white flowers, four petals on the tips of the stems. And you can see these are starting to also produce the seed pods, which are these long um, structures that will have seeds in them. If you go down to the base of the plant, you can see that those leaves that overwintered are still there, the first year leaves, which are more scalloped than they are toothed and a little bit less pointy and distinctive looking, but um, you can still learn to identify those if you want to do some winter control. And the most obvious feature here, the defining feature is that if you take one of these leaves and you tear it up and you crush it and you smell that leaf, it's gonna smell like garlic. Now, to remove this plant, you just grab as much of it as you can. It should come up pretty easily. And most of the time, you will get the whole root. So that is a really good way to control this plant, as long as you then take this with you. If you just throw it back down on the ground, those seeds can continue to mature and be viable, and the, you won't have done any good at all. So what's the problem with garlic mustard? Well, it displaces the native plants that should be in an area. Because it overwinters in an evergreen state, it's able to leaf out and grow very quickly in the spring, um, quickly overtaking and shading out some of those native wildflowers that you might have learned about during Jen's talk uh, during the first 15 minutes in the forest. It's also allelopathic. Allelopathic means that it produces a chemical that inhibits the growth of other plants. Um, a lot of plants are allelopathic. Black walnuts are a famous native example of an allelopathic plant, but garlic mustards are as well. And with the loss and the replacement of our native plants and our native early spring bloomers, of course that affects our insects and our native pollinators that are so important that then don't have that food source that they've come to rely upon. So garlic mustard can be controlled by pulling it. It can also be controlled with mowing or trimming um, as long as the plant materials are then removed from the site so that they don't germinate and perpetuate the problem into the next generation. You can also control it with the use of herbicides, um, just about any all-purpose herbicide as long as it's applied according to the label. It's important to remember that those herbicides can affect other plants, uh, native plants or desirable garden plants that you don't want to be affected. And one way that you can reduce that risk is by using the product in the winter when the garlic mustard has that evergreen um, first year stage and the other plants are dormant or not present. Our next invasive species is the bush honeysuckle. There are actually three species of invasive bush honeysuckles in Virginia, 
but we're not going to worry about being able to tell them apart. Bush honeysuckles were introduced from Asia. They were planted for ornamental purposes and also for wildlife habitat. These are mostly a problem in the mountainous part of the state and in northern Virginia. It's not really very prevalent in eastern Virginia, but out here it's very common, very widespread. We're going to take a closer look now and learn how to identify the bush honeysuckle. Here in the springtime, the most recognizable part of the bush honeysuckle is the flower. It looks like you expect a honeysuckle flower to look like the Japanese honeysuckle that you might be familiar with. And it smells also like a honeysuckle flower, like idle summer days home from school as a child. And their flowers are born in pairs, sort of pairs of pairs along the stem. And in the fall, when the flowers are done, they're almost done now, but a berry will develop there where each flower is. So you'll have pairs of pairs of berries in the fall. They're bright red. And that's pretty distinctive um, for shrubs around here. That, that really is going to help you to identify it. If you come to this plant when it's not in bloom or doesn't have berries, you'll notice that the leaves come off of the stem exactly opposite of each other. Uh, we call this opposite. The other arrangement is alternate. And this will be one clue to help you identify the bush honeysuckle. There is a native bush honeysuckle. It's rare and occurs at elevation. So if you're seeing a bush honeysuckle, it is probably one of the three invasive species. Other things that you might confuse this with when it's not in bloom are the viburnums. Viburnums are native shrubs that are also opposite leaved. And there are many, many species of viburnums and they're all a little bit different. So it might be a little bit hard to tell that this is not a viburnum. But I'm gonna show you another hint for that in just a minute. I brought my little clippers and I'm gonna clip off a branch of this bush honeysuckle and show you that it's not a viburnum. Here's the stem that I cut off of the bush honeysuckle. You can see the flowers, the opposite arrangement of the leaves as well as the twigs. And down here at the end of the stem, you'll see that it's hollow. So the exotic non-native bush honeysuckles have hollow stems. There's no pith inside. Both the viburnums and the native bush honeysuckle are not gonna have hollow stems. So that's gonna help you to identify this invasive plant. Like most of the invasive species that we're learning about, bush honeysuckle is mainly a problem in that it displaces the native shrubs that should be growing in this place. So I've been walking here every day. There are some elderberry, there's some spice bush, but there is a lot of bush honeysuckle and it's taking that space where those native shrubs should be. And there's some evidence that it provides um, poor nesting sites for birds. So it looks like a good nesting site because it has nice stout twigs, but it leaves birds more expo exposed to uh, nest predation and uh, the eggs being uh, eaten by predators. So in terms of controlling bush honeysuckle, you can use mechanical removal, but you need to make sure that you remove the entire root system because anything left behind can re-sprout. You can also control it, uh, limit its spread with mowing. You need to mow at least twice a year for that to be effective. You can also use an herbicide. A glyphosate product might work better than a triclopyr product, which is unusual for bushy and woody species. You want to check with your local extension office or uh, another reputable source to get the best uh, recommendation for which herbicide to use. But herbicides are best used um, on woody species, at least, in the fall, in the late summer or early fall, because that's when the trees are taking all of the nutrients from the leaves back down into the roots. And so the herbicide will also be transported down into the roots and do more damage. And bush honeysuckles are also susceptible to fire and so prescribed fire can be used to control them. Our third and final invasive species is the Alanthus, or Tree of Heaven. Alanthus is native to China and was introduced into the United States twice, once in Philadelphia in the late 1700s and again in the 1850s on the west coast. In the east, it was planted as an urban tree. It's famously the tree that grows in Brooklyn. On the west, it was first planted by Chinese immigrants for cultural reasons. 
Tree of Heaven has been in the news a lot recently because it's the preferred host of the spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly is a new invasive insect species, also from China, where it grows on Atlantis, and it has now become a nuisance and also an agricultural pest as well as a forest pest in the Philadelphia area and here in Virginia in the Winchester area. So now let's zoom in and take a closer look and learn to identify the Alanthus. Here's the bark on a mature Alanthus tree. You can see that it's kind of silvery and tight and it might remind you a little bit of a cantaloupe. Here are the leaves of an Alanthus sapling. You can see that they are compound leaves so that this entire structure back to where it joins the main stem is one leaf. All of this came out of a single leaf bud and we call this a compound leaf because it's made up of many leaflets. It might remind you of a sumac or a black walnut. If you look closely at a single leaflet, you'll notice that the edges of it are smooth, not toothed the way that they are on a black walnut or a sumac. However, most leaflets are going to have one or two teeth near the base of the leaflet. And those teeth actually have a small gland on them. Alanthus stems are very brittle and can be easily broken. And if you break one at an angle, you'll see that the inside pith is spongy. It's soft, but continuous. This makes it different from the walnut, which has a chambered pith. If you handle the leaves very much, or even the stems or the inside of them, you will notice that they smell very distinctive. It's not a good smell. It's been compared to burnt or rancid peanut butter. Alanthus is a problem like the other species we've learned about because it spreads very quickly and takes over an area out competing native vegetation. It grows very quickly, very tall, and it produces many, many seeds on the female trees. Alanthus is dioecious, meaning that it has male trees and female trees, and female trees can produce up to 300,000 seeds a year. Alanthus also sprouts from the roots readily, suckering new trees off of existing tree root systems, and will come back very quickly from the roots when cut down. It's also allelopathic, like we learned about with the garlic mustard. If you try to cut Alanthus down, it's going to grow back from its roots. And so most of the time, the only way to really control it is with an herbicide application. Small plants can be controlled with a foliar application, but larger plants, you need to use either a basal bark application or a hack and squirt application of a triclopyr product. Thank you for joining me for this week's 15 Minutes in the Forest. If you're watching this with me today on Zoom, please come back next week at the same time and place for a new 15 Minutes in the Forest. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe so that you'll know every time we post a new 15 Minutes in the Forest. Next week, we'll hear from Bill Worrell, the Extension Forester for Southwest Virginia. Following that, we'll hear about mountain tree identification, Femmelschlag for oak regeneration, Piedmont tree ID, lichens, a nature walk, and the Big Tree Program. We look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.